Hello everyone, and thank you for participating in HashiTalks 2023. Today I'm going to talk to you about why you should use Vault as your console certificate authority. My name is Thomas Kulo. I am a senior staff solutions engineer at HashiCorp, and my pronouns are he, him. I've been at HashiCorp for almost five years now, and I spent the past couple of years focusing primarily on console. Previous to my time at HashiCorp, I did systems and infrastructure engineering in higher education and e-commerce. The bottom of the screen there, you can see my GitHub profile name. Uh, shortly after Hashi Talks are finished, I will be uploading not only this presentation, but also all the collateral you need to reproduce the demo environments that I'm going to go through in my talk today. Let's start off by talking about CA usage in console. There are two primary uses for a certificate authority in console. The first of which is the console client auto encryption or auto config. These are two very related topics that are there to help enable or ease the deployment of console clients. There's also the console service mesh or what you will oftentimes hear uh, referred to as console connect. Today I'm going to focus primarily on the implications of your CA choice within the console service mesh, but the overall ideas are also broadly applicable to the usage of the CA in auto-encrypt and auto-config. At the core of the console service mesh is mutual TLS or mTLS, and this is the case for pretty much every service mesh that exists out there. Every instance of every service on the service mesh has a TLS certificate embedded in which is the identity of that service. And that's how on the wire those services identify themselves to each other. That service identity is used when controlling service access or what console will call intentions. So when service A talks to service B, not only do both sides exchange identity information that happens to be in TLS certificates, but that destination, that service B, uses that identity of its caller and compares it against a list of intentions or access control rules and decides whether or not service A is actually allowed to talk to it. Really what we're asking is, who are you? And both sides of the connection are asking that question but then in addition, the destination service is asking, are you allowed in? It is comparing the identity of the caller against its list of rules and making an access control decision. And because we are making access control decisions based entirely on identity, and that identity is embedded entirely in TLS certificates, those TLS certificates are very important to console, and we need to do the appropriate thing to protect them to make sure that we can actually trust the identity information that is exchanged by both sides. So what do we need to protect? Well, let's start by talking about what we don't care about at all. We do not care about certificates at all. And this may come as a mild surprise, especially if you've done anything with TLS, because a lot of what we think about when we're deploying TLS is how do we manage those certificates, provisioning them, distributing them, uh, renewing them when it's appropriate, but we don't care about protecting them at all. Because a certificate is only an identity assertion, a bit of data that says the presenter of the certificate is, for example, www.hashicorp.com and instructions on how to verify it. Or for example, here's how the presenter will prove that it actually legitimately holds a certificate for this identity. We throw around certificates all the time. They are by design public documents. And in fact, on the day that I created this slide, here's a command that I ran to ask the HashiCorp web servers, please give me your entire certificate, which it happily did. Your web browser does this all the time whenever you visit a site that is protected by TLS, whether it's the HashiCorp website, your bank, or an online retailer. Again, by design, certificates are public documents. But if we look further in that certificate, we see a section that talks about the subject's prob public key. And if there's a public key, is there a corresponding private key? And in fact, there is. A given public key has one and only one private key. The holder of that private key can perform a signing operation over a piece of data. 
And that signature can be verified with the corresponding public key and only with that corresponding public key. So that allows anyone with a public key to verify that the signature was performed with the private key without requiring any access at all to the private key. And that's how TLS does things. TLS will exchange certificates and will create a signature of da over data. That signature created with that public-private key pair, and it's, ex it's a signature over data that is exchanged during the handshake to prove the identity assertion. This is how TLS works, and that public-private key pair is very important to TLS actually working properly and making sure that the other end is actually the other end. So what do we need to protect? We need to protect those private keys, which you know makes sense given the name private keys, something we do not want to share. We care about those private keys because that, again, is what the presenter of that certificate uses to prove that it is the valid holder of that certificate and not some random bystander. But we only know about that public-private key pair because it was in the certificate presented. How do we know that wasn't faked? What's to stop me, for example, for creating a certificate that claims that I am www.hashicorp.com, uh, having in it a public key that is, corresponds to a private key that I made up and thus know, and then start handing it around? How can we trust the information in that certificate that was presented to us? Well, again, if we look back in the certificate, we see information about the certificate's issuer and the signature um, over that certificate and the authority's key identifier. And these are all clues on how TLS works to prove that certificates are valid. Because we want to not only be able to verify the certificate, but that it ultimately came from somewhere that we trust. And to do that, our LEAF certificates, which are down here at the bottom of this diagram for a particular service or maybe a console client agent, are signed by higher up CAs or certificate authorities. And a certificate authority is simply a certificate which signs other certificates. And there may be any number of these certificates going up to a primary root CA. And that's what in console we care about. Everything participating in the console service mesh knows that primary root CA. And from there, we can build a valid path of trust from that leave certificate through some number of intermediates up to that primary root CA. And with that, we can figure out how to trust any number of certificates as long as they're in that path. This is what your browser does when you go and visit the HashiCorp website or your bank or an online retailer. Your browser or your operating system has a few hundred certificates that it trusts as root CAs. And as long as there is a path from a certificate presented by a particular website up to something that is a root CA that your local system trusts, we know that that path is valid and therefore that presented certificate is valid. And so let's talk about what we need to do to protect those private keys. Well, protecting the keys or the private keys of leaf certificates, those actual in certificates for a given service is fairly easy. First of all, they're pretty low impact. Every instance of every service on the console service mesh has a unique certificate with a unique private key. Now, all of the certificates for a given service have embedded in it the identity of that service, but they're all distinct certificates. And when a local console agent is asked to create a LEAF certificate, it generates a private key locally, creates a certificate signing request, and asks the next layer up to sign our certificate. That certificate comes back, it's public, so we don't care and don't need to protect it. But that private key, which is what ties that certificate to the actual valid holder of that certificate, is only ever stored in memory, never on disk, even when local agent caching uh, caches that certificate and that key. Uh, and so it is relatively safe. 
But as we go up in layers, we may encounter intermediate console signing CAs until we get to that root CA. And those are more and more valuable because the signatures of those certificates are responsible for proving the identity of more and more things in the console service mesh. And at the very top is the primary root CA. Again, those are all just certificates which happen to sign other certificates. And especially if we have the root CA certificates private key, if we have it, we can sign anything and we can be any service on the service mesh. And so there are best practices. This is recognized in the industry and there's an industry wide set of standards um, established by various standards bodies on how to protect the private keys of certificate authorities from NIST in the United States, from the CA Browser Forum, um, from NCSC in the United Kingdom. All talk about, and these are just a few examples of best practices, on how to safely secure those private keys to minimize the chance of a compromise or something bad happening to those private keys. So let's look at how console with the built-in console CA treats its private keys. We're gonna to go to a demo here shortly and here are the important bits of configuration. The full configuration is in the presentation repository, but here are the key pieces. And we have a directory where we're telling console to store its data. We have turned on console connect and we have told console to use the built-in console CA provider. So let's switch to our demo environment and examine the root certificate. And so I have set up a demo environment here where I have set up console as its CA and I'll ask it for the root CA, which again, completely public, so it doesn't need to protect it at all. And I'll get that certificate back. And in that certificate, like we expect, there is a public key section. And again, that corresponds to the private key associated with this root CA certificate. Now, how does console store its data? Well, console uses the RAF protocol for distributed consensus and to maintain distributed state. When we say that console is a highly available replicated service, that distributed state is what is replicated. Uh, and I'm not gonna go into the details of how RAF works or how console's implementation of RAF actually persists data on disk, um, but there's a few key details here. Uh, in my particular configuration, there's a raft.db file in that directory, which is the raft log. And there may also be any number of snapshots in that particular directory. And the latest snapshot plus that raft.db file combined hold all of the console data for that console data center. And so what can we find in there? Well, let's go back to our demo environment. We can see that I have that raft.db file. I can see that I've got a, a couple of snapshots here. I can see that in the latest snapshot, there's a state.bin file. So that state.bin file and then above raft.db file combined represent all of the data that is stored in console. And again, I'm not gonna go through the details of what's in those files or what the format of those files are. We're going to brute force just look through those two files for anything that looks like it might be a private key. And when I do so, I find something that looks like a private key. But is it a private key for something we really care about? Well, let's kind of pull it apart. I can ask OpenSSL to take that private key and print out the corresponding public key that goes with it. And remember, there's a one-to-one -one match. Any private key has one and only one public key and vice versa. And so when I do that, this is the public key that is associated with the private key that we just found. And it is only associated with the public key, or excuse me, with the private key that we found inside of, or inside of console storage. And again, I can go ask console, give me your root certificate and show me the public key for it. And when I do so, I can see that these two things match. And because they match, and because of that one-to-one -one correspondence, what I have found in RAF's storage or in console storage is the private key associated with the console root CA. 
So what does this mean? Well, I have a private key um, that I found in the console server raft storage or raft log. That private key has one and only one corresponding public key, which we just printed out, which matches exactly the public key that is in the console primary root CA certificate, which means this is the key which signs everything. What's the implication of that? Well, remember, the console service mesh is an identity-based networking tool. We do access control decisions based on identity, not things like IPs and ports. And we connect those services together based on their identity. And the identity is proven on the wire with certificates. And that means that if I have the public key, or excuse me, if I have the private key for the console root CA, and that ultimately is the thing that I'm going to trust to verify the identity of every service on the service mesh, if I have that signing key, if I have that private key, I can be any service on the console service mesh. Again, with this key, an attacker can be any service they want on the console service mesh. Now, how does this change when we use Vault as our CA? Well, let's take a look. I've got a demo environment set up for that as well. Again, these are the important bits of configuration. Here's where my data is stored. I've turned Connect on. But I've also told Console to use the Vault CA provider. Again, the full configuration is in the presentation repository. So much like I did with the Console CA setup, I'm going to go look at the Vault CA setup. I'm going to ask for the public key that Console has. And again, we don't care about this certificate. Uh, and so I'm going to print out that, that uh, console root CA certificate. And again, here is a public key associated with it. So starting off much like we did previously. And OK, we still have that raft.db file. And we still have some number of snapshots. And in that snapshot, there's that same state.bin file. So that state.bin file and that raft.db file combined are the all of the storage in this console cluster where we're using Vault as our CA. So much like we did in the environment where we're using console as our CA, we're going to brute force look through those files for anything that looks like a private key. And when we do so, we find nothing. Yeah, this is what we just did. We looked through the console raft storage. So what changes? What changes when we use Vault as your certificate authority in console? Well, if I set up console to use the Vault CA provider, all certificate signing operations are handled by Vault. And the keying material, which is what we care about, that or that private key, is stored inside of Vault's cryptographic barrier. No keys ever live on disk unencrypted. Here's a diagram from the Vault uh, documentation that talks about this cryptographic barrier. All of the data that leaves this cryptographic barrier and goes to a storage backend, no matter what storage backend you're using in Vault, is encrypted. So anything that is persisted in persistent storage, disk or anything like that, is encrypted. But what's in Vault storage? Well, let's take a couple of looks here. First of all, I happen to know how to ask Vault, pretty please show me information that normally you wouldn't. And I'm gonna go through that fairly quickly. Again, you can follow along with this demo environment after the fact to kind of go through this in more detail. But I can ask Vault, all right, uh, there's, a, there's a secrets engine that I've configured to be my CA root. And I can ask Vault for, give me a list of the issuers. Uh, basically, these are the, what private keys are you using in the PKI Secrets Engine to sign certificates that you're asked to sign? And I can see that there is only one provider or only one issuer, uh, and it's the default one. So remember this string here, uh, or at least recognize it. And I can also get the UUID of this Secrets Engine um, so when I've mounted this secret engine, the, con the Connect DC Vault CA root, um, internally, Vault kind of keeps track of it by this UUID. And I happen to know, again, Vault, pretty please show me data uh, inside of your cryptographic barrier. 
And I can see that information, including the certificate and a key ID. All right, so this is the key ID of the actual key that is being used to sign any certificate in this secret engine by this particular issuer. And remember, there's only one issuer, the default one. And with that, I can ask for the key. And when I do, there's the private key. And again, we're gonna go through the same example that we did previously. I can turn it into the corresponding public key, and I compare that against the public key that is in the certificate, and I can see that they match. So if you compare these two values, they match. Now, what makes this different than console? Couple of things here. So I was making use of this slash sys slash raw endpoint in Vault. By default, Vault does not have this endpoint enabled because it violates a lot of Vault's security mechanisms uh, or its security guidelines. Key of which is material only ever really goes into Vault's cryptographic barrier. You, you can't really ask for it back, especially things like private keys. So when we generated that private key, we told Vault, hey, never let that outside of your cryptographic barrier. But I can turn on this special endpoint and get that data out. But you have to have configured your vaults to be able to do that. And you have to have presented a very privileged vault token to be able to do that in the first case. I did this primarily to show you that obviously the private key needs to live somewhere inside a vault because all it needs is to do signature operations, but also to give us a clue of, well, if I have Vault storing its data on disk, let's kind of go look through that and satisfy ourselves that it's not there just in plain text on disk like it is with console. And that's what we're going to do next. So I can look uh, in Vault. My Vault happens to be configured to store its data in this path, and I happen to know how to translate the path uh, to show me this actual key. So this is where, when I asked for, you know, slash sys, slash raw, you know, all of this stuff, this corresponds to the actual path on disk where this data is stored. I've configured Vault to store things locally on disk. And I get back a particular value. Uh, it's a bit of JSON, has one key that says value, and it looks like that value is base64 encoded. All right, well, let's decode it. If I do that, I can do, you know, I get that and I get back, you know, this looks like a lot of binary data. Um, the first four octets of which are just a one. Maybe this is a version number. Um, but if you know anything about certificates, you may know that, you know, you can encode things with PEM encoding, P-E-M, uh, which is a, you know, plain text base 64, or you can use D-E-R, DARE encoding, which I don't remember what that stands for, but that's raw binary encoding of that data. And you may know that you can ask OpenSSL to take a binary encoded blob of anything, in this case, a private key, and try to decrypt it for us. And so that's what I'm going to do, and I get an error message. Uh, so, you know, even if the, you know, we, we've kind of verified that, all right, well, this isn't a plain text private key. Uh, it's not even one of those binary encoded private keys. Uh, I'm hoping that I'm close to convincing you that this is actually data that is stored in Vault's cryptographic barrier without having to go into the details of how that cryptographic barrier actually works. So what changes when we use Vault as our certificate authority? Well, we get the security and logging of Vault signing our certificates when we leverage it in console. And we keep that sensitive keying material safely protected inside of Vault's cryptographic barrier. So in summary, with the console CA provider, the private key is stored unencrypted on disk. With the Vault CA provider, the private key is stored encrypted on disk. We're much happier. So what are the caveats to using Vault as your console CA? There's a few. Uh, astute viewers may point out that the token parameter or auth method parameters, if you use that, are stored in plain text on disk. So if I used a Vault token, um, console obviously needs to not only know where Vault is, but it needs to be able to authenticate to Vault in order to ask it to do things. And I may have a token or an auth method where 
important information is stored on disk. Um, so what are ways of mitigating that? Well, use an auth method, which is appropriate for your environment, and maybe one that doesn't hard code those credentials on disk. Uh, maybe one of the cloud IAM methods, uh, if you happen to be operating in that kind of environment. But if an attacker on the console server um, is, is on the console server and they have either the token or they can use that auth method configured to just ask Vault to do things for me, um, you know, can I just ask Vault to sign random certificates for me? Well, potentially, um, yes. But you also have additional opportunities for audit logging and analysis to detect anomalous behavior. You're also adding a layer of security for attacks on things like backups. Perhaps an attacker doesn't have access to the live console servers, but they've managed to get access to a backup, and maybe that backup is not encrypted properly. We're giving ourselves a layer of protection because we don't have the key, the private key, just sitting there in that backup or that snapshot of the console servers. Um, we may have a token in that backup, so maybe they could use that token, but there are methods that you can use or techniques that you can use in Vault to limit where you can even use a Vault token, so make it harder for the attacker to leverage that token. And what we're doing is kind of reasonable actions to make an attack more complicated and also increase the likelihood of detection because those are things which will help with your defense. And it may provide additional data in a post-attack um, analysis to determine the full scope of the compromise, which can be very important. If you can use this additional data, this logging uh, and things like that to prove that only specific bits of information were compromised, then you can focus your efforts on mitigating the impact of that instead of having to mitigate potentially everything and anything being compromised. This is defense in depth. There's other things that might be useful. Uh, depending on your industry, you may have regulatory requirements that mandate that a private key uh, is encrypted whenever it's persisted to storage um, uh, or is, is never persisted to storage in an unencrypted form. Um, this may also be part of your corporate risk mitigation strategy. Um, I've done this in my career, those 200 page checklists that someone says, all right, you gotta check off everything on here before we approve your usage of this thing or before you pass your audit. And I, like anyone who's ever gone through any of those things, certainly have very strong opinions about the actual security that this brings to us. But from a pragmatic standpoint, if you can demonstrate that the private key is never stored unencrypted on disk in storage, um, you can check that box and move along to using the console service mesh to help protect your security in other ways. So again, we're not talking about absolute security because there is no such thing as absolute security, but pragmatically, you just gotta check those check marks off to get the people to sign off on things that are, you have to have sign off on those things. And using Vault as your console CA may provide you a path to help meet those requirements. Now there is additional complexity. Using Vault as your console CA does mean more moving parts because console now has a dependency on Vault. Uh, if console is unable to access Vault, though it isn't immediately fatal. Um, certificates which are still valid will continue to work. They have a lifespan associated with them. Uh, but anything requiring new certificates, however, will break, whether that's normal certificate rotation or generating new certificates uh, for a new instance of a service uh, or for a new service entirely. But you can mitigate that. Vault, just like console, can run in a highly available cluster with no single point of failure. Uh, so you can get around that. But again, there is management overhead there, however. We're going to end today's discussion about should I do it? Should I use Vault as your console certificate authority? That's the key question here. And I'm going to use the standard weasel out mechanism of saying that is a question that only you can answer. But I'm not being facetious here. It's true. Only you can truly answer whether or not you should use Vault as your console CA. Now, I am certainly an advocate for using Vault as your console certificate authority. But at minimum, I hope that you have a greater understanding now of the implications of whatever decision you happen to make so that you can make an informed decision to satisfy your particular situation and requirements. 
I want to thank you again for participating in Hashi Talks 2023. Uh, there's a link there at the bottom of the screen where the um, this material, so both the presentation and all the collateral, will be uploaded to my GitHub profile shortly after Hashi Talks is finished. Thank you again for your time.